there's a lot that we can gain by reading um, passages in the Scripture, of course, a lot of knowledge. I want to look today, though, uh, starting in John chapter 6, we'll read verse 35, and a lot of what this lesson covers is the things that we take in or the things that we consume. And John chapter 6, verse 35, it says this, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh, he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And that's two things that as humans we can identify with readily because we are either hungry or thirsty. Typically, we're either going to get some food or we're going to get something to drink, sometimes both at the same time. And Christ here telling us that if you come to Him, that you're never going to hunger and you're never going to thirst. And we still have physical things that we need to address, but yet spiritually we can see how Christ can fill us up. He can totally take care of all those things. And a great deal of the information that we take in can be detrimental to us depending on where we get that information from. Case in point, you go to Matthew chapter 16 in verse 6, and Christ warned us very bluntly about this when he was speaking there of course we can learn from this too then jesus said unto them take heed and beware of the leaven of the pharisees and of the sadducees we know that a little leaven leaven the whole lump we know how it can affect us and how that it can have a if it's the right type of leaven how it can have a good impact on our life and a good impact on us want learning what we should do to serve god faithfully or it can have a negative impact on us now here Christ was warning about the Pharisees and Sadducees. You've got to think about this. The Pharisees and Sadducees at the time, they were what was looked at as religious leaders of the time. They were individuals that people would look up to. They would look to and they would ask questions, of course, and some would follow after them. In verse 7 it says, And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Now they were looking at this in a carnal sense, and it is because we've taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said to them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? Do ye, do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets ye took up, neither the seven thousand, neither the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many baskets ye took up. Don't you remember those situations? We could have all kinds of food. That's not what Christ was talking about, not physical food. He wasn't referring to that here. How it is it that you do not understand that I speak not it not to you concerning the bread that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not to beware of the leaven of bread, the physical bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees, the things that they were teaching. The things that individuals teach others can have a detrimental impact spiritually on individuals and how that they either are serving God or persuade them uh, away from God. And it is, we see that all the time. We see people that are, and you even sometimes it is broadcast on the news, how people are, they're persuaded to follow after a man. And sometimes those men, they'll call themselves Christ. Now they're antichrist. They'll call herself that, and they'll cause them to do all sorts of abominable things, sometimes commit suicide. They'll cause them to do all sorts of things, and Christ is telling people to beware of that, to watch that, to be careful, listen to His words, and not an individual's words, not just of a man's thought process. People can be very swift. They can be very, as you would put it, a silver tongue when they're speaking, and they can convince someone if we don't compare it to what Christ said. And if we do compare it to what Christ says, then we can disregard everything the world says. If you go to John chapter 4, John chapter 4 and verse 9 beginning, Then saith the woman of the Samaritan, um, Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest a drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. See, the Jews, they didn't have any dealings with them, so she's really shocked that he's talking to her about this and giving me water. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gifts of God, the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. What Christ brings to us is totally different than what the world does for us. And the world satisfies us for a temporary period of time, but Christ satisfies us for a permanent 
permanent period of time going forward. We're always filled. If you're filled with Christ, then you are always able to bear fruit for God, of course, going forward following what God says. Now, individuals that see and deal with mankind and only follow after man's doctrines and only follow after, and you could go back, there's people that try to follow after the Pharisees' doctrines or Sadducees' doctrines. There's people this day and time, they'll go back and they'll go under the old law, they'll go back into the Old Testament and they'll try to be justified by the law. Of course, Christ warned about that, not to follow after that as well. There's individuals that go back and they try to follow all kinds of things and they need to look to Christ. That was one of the problems that they had at that time too. Of course, the Sadducees, they didn't even believe in a resurrection. Now, you can imagine their surprise seeing the things that Christ done, the individuals that would, were there to witness that, how what a surprise they had. And we can see that Christ has, not only did He heal people that were blind, raise, He raised people from the dead, not only did He allow people to speak that could not speak before, but when you follow after Him, you have life. You have fulfillment. You have something that man has struggled with so long to receive, yet they just need to turn to Christ and you can receive that. As a matter of fact, over in John, back to John, it's chapter 6. I'm going to go back there again. I'm going to read verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat the loaves and were filled. We focus so much on the physical sometimes that we miss the entire spiritual aspect of things. And even here, these individuals, they seen the miracles, yet they were just following after Him because of the food. That was why. That was the only reason they were following after Him. These individuals He's talking to here, you're following after Me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. They were following for the wrong reason. The completely wrong reason. Christ could give them food and water and physically would be filled up. And guess what? It's only for a period of time. Their body would still need nourishment again. But if they were following after Christ for the right reasons, then they could be filled spiritually permanently. Permanently. Not having that hunger to look after something that they could receive fulfillment already. If you go over to Matthew, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. I'm going to start at verse 2 when I get there. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Sometimes Satan tries to focus our mind on the physical even our lowest points, because we know that Christ was fasting and the tempter had come to Him. Satan came to Him and tried to tempt Him and tried to get Him to make, as He said, if, if thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. Could Christ do that? Oh yeah, that's, that's no, no big deal. You think about the fact that He could raise someone from the dead making bread out of the stones, that's no problem. That's no problem. Think of all the individuals He could feed. No problem. No problem at all. Yet it was not for someone to tempt him to tell him, if thou be the Son of God. That was a temptation. Satan tries to present us with situations sometimes when we're at our lowest and say, well, if you can, why don't you do it? Well, that's what was going on here in Christ, of course, giving perfect answers. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's where we get our fulfillment and our purpose from. If we only live for the physical, we're going to be let down drastically. So we can't do that. We can't live just for the physical. We live for the spiritual, looking toward heaven. As a matter of fact, in Genesis, if you go back there to Genesis chapter 25, we're going to look at a situation where it was a similar situation in that someone is very, very hungry, but yet they are only looking at the here and now. And that's what Satan wants you to do. He wants you to look at the here and now only, because when you do that, you lose sight of the eternal that we need to look at the eternal life. In Genesis chapter 25, verse 20, it says this, And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that, sa- with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. 
And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy, thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. He despised it because he gave it away for that to him, and he sold it just for something to eat right then. Now Satan wants us to do the same thing. Satan, he wants us to sell something that's far more important in that it is an eternal birthright because as Christians, we have a birthright. We have a birthright in Christ in that we have an inheritance and he's trying to with these sins, these temptations, trying to get us to sell our birthrights so that we will no longer have that inheritance in heaven. He's trying to do the same thing. He's saying, aren't you hungry? Don't you want this? Isn't your body desiring these things? Don't you want to be wealthy? Don't you want to have all these things? Why don't you just sell this? You'll be so happy. You'll be physically filled up with these things. That's what Satan tries to do. He tries to get us to get rid of something, not thinking about how far down the road that we're going to look back and we're going to despise the fact that we, if we follow that path, how we would despise that we would have given up something so important for something so little. That's what Satan wants us to do and we have to watch. And Christ warns us of that to be looking toward heaven, looking toward Him in Mark chapter 8. It's very important for us to look and see how that Christ handled things and how He addressed things and the importance He played on, placed on things rather than the importance that we place on things. Because as human beings, we would place great importance on physical things. We would place great importance on because that's what we see and what we feel. If not for Christ, if not for God revealing it and looking to see what is beyond this life, we would have no understanding of that. We would have very little understanding of what is better than what we have right now. In Mark chapter 8, in verse 35, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever shall... Who shall, whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. It might be easy sometimes for us when we are dealing with other individuals, crowds or groups or even employers to be ashamed of Christ. It might be easy or comfortable physically to not act as a Christian. It may be comfortable, but it's not profitable. It's more important to look what is profitable for us eternally than what is comfortable for us physically. It was comfortable and it was comforting physically for Esau to take that pottage and eat that pottage and be filled up for a temporary period of time, but it was not, it was not profitable in that he lost his birthright. And it is a temporary thing, so we have to watch and be careful. It is comfortable. It is comfortable when you have fasted for a period of time. I don't know how many, of course, that may hear this have fasted for a period of time. It's comfortable to not fast, but it's profitable sometimes to fast. It's profitable to us to fast. It's important for us to learn what God says and not just focus on what we think is best for us. If you go over to John chapter 2, John chapter 2 and verse 7 beginning, Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was. But the servants which drew the water, the governor of the feast, called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then, they, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. Jesus turning the water into wine. When Jesus got involved in it, it became great. It became great. It became more, it became better than they could have imagined. It was the best that they had. And it was really surprising to them, as he said, typically you have the good wine first, 
And then you put out the bad wine later because nobody really cares at that point. People are well drunk, they've drunk, all, they've drunk wine, and they don't really care as long as they're drinking more. But no, what happened here was when Christ came, the best was set out. And that's what happens now. When you have all these different doctrines of men that come out and they bring these different doctrines and they'll tell ways that are what people would seem to be good, but yet when Christ is involved, it becomes the best that we can partake of. It fills us up totally. There's a lot of people who are swept away with doctrines. I could name countless different doctrines that men come up with and try to pull people out and try to satisfy their spiritual need. Every human being has a spiritual need. We have physical needs. We have to drink water and food, just like I said before. But you know, we have a spiritual need. If you didn't, people would not typically be involved in all these different types of doctrines. They wouldn't be involved in all these different types of ways that they think is going to lead them to a better life sometimes, to a better path, and even to heaven. But if Christ isn't in it, it's worthless. If some man is just some man, they're looking at some man then it's worthless. It's useless. It will leave you hungry and thinking over your life. If you get to a point to understand when you read God's Word, understand that what you've done is not following what Christ said, you get to a point in your life and look back and say, I've wasted all this time following after just what man said. And there's no shortage of doctrines you can look at, let's say, online. You look at doctrines of men online. There's no shortage. And it's so odd, and it was when Christ was here, and it was when we can look back at the Israelites and we can see what God gave to those individuals to follow. It's so strange to think that you could have the way, have the way and people would disregard it. Have the way to fill them up and disregard it. It is just like you have an entire group or entire world of individuals that are starving physically and have a feast and nobody wants to partake of it because they say, well, no, I'm going to go find my own way. I'm going to go find my own path. I'm going to go find something over here. That oh, shiny thing over there looks better to me than being filled spiritually. It looks better to me. And it's so strange to think that, but there, that happens a lot. That happens a great deal. In John chapter 6, is where I'm going to turn back to for a second. In John chapter 6, I'm going to read verse 25. And when he had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? And Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat the loaves, and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that which, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed, telling us to not just focus on the physical things, to labor for the spiritual, to endure, to make sure that we're going toward Christ, not toward man, not toward just the physical. And that's exactly what he said here based on the fact that that's what they were looking for because you did eat the loaves and were filled. Labor not for that meat which perishes, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, that which will fill you up, that will grant you eternal life, that will give you the thing that we we need so much. There's so many people that are suffering in this world and they need Christ. If they would come to Christ, and that's all they have to do. You know, the, could you imagine all the people? We read about in the Scriptures these individuals. We know not everything is written down for us, but could you imagine all the individuals that came to Christ and were healed, but how many people didn't? You think about that? How many people didn't? Today we have the same situation. How many people can spiritually be forgiven? They can be cleansed of all sin, yet they don't come to Him. Well, it's untold amounts of people. We don't know how many people didn't come to Christ, didn't seek Him out, didn't for whatever reason, maybe because of doctrines of men, maybe because of embarrassment, maybe because they didn't want people to know. And We can read about people that were ashamed of Christ. They didn't want to go to Christ. There's a crowd of people. Well, my friends over here, these friends, if they see me go to Him, I know they're going to make fun of me. I know that they're going to look down on me. I'm not going to be in this group anymore. How many people didn't receive healing? Only because they didn't go to Christ. Not because they wouldn't have received healing. Not because they wouldn't have been made whole. People let the world hold them back. They don't have to, but they do. But in John chapter 6 and verse 53, The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, Ye have, no life, ye have no life in you. 
Whosoever my flesh, whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For the fle- for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. And the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so that he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead, he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So many things, individuals will look at this and they'll say, wait a second, how can I eat the physical flesh and the the blood of Christ? We can see so many times that people would misunderstand what Christ was saying. They'd misunderstand how He is applying these things. A lot of times people are spiritually blind and they do not follow after what Christ said. People could take these passages and they could distort them a great deal, but we know how Christ speaking, how you are filled up spiritually when you partake of Him, when you're in Him, when you are following after Him, when your sins are washed away, when you're totally cleansed, when you're nourished in Christ. If you go over to Colossians chapter 3, In verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We've done that this morning. We're singing songs and hymns. We've done that. And that's something that people need to do. And you have to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. You cannot serve God faithfully if you do not follow Christ, of course. People try that. Just as as I was talking about how the people will look back and they'll say, well, you know, Christ, they'll look at Christ and say, yeah, he was a, they'll say a good person or they'll refer to him in various ways. No, Christ isn't just a good person. Christ is the way. He's the way. He's the only way. He's how we are nourished spiritually. If we do not follow after Him, if we do not partake of Him, if we do not eat of the bread that He provides to us, we are going to be in famine, in a season of famine. You know, that's the problem with... I'm going to go to John chapter 15, but that's the problem with people today. And what was the problem with people then? And is the problem going forward as long as the world should stand as people that do not partake of... Christ, that do not listen to what He says, do not actually digest His words, is that they're in a season of famine. They're so needing Christ, yet they want to follow every other way. It's just like, and I think about this, it's just like a child. You take these children and you tell a child, go over here, this is going to be okay, just listen to me for a second. Listen to what I'm saying. You're going to be filled, you're going to be taken care of, and they want to do everything else. The kid wants to run all over the place. They want to do everything else. Humanity is the same way. We as humans, we want to go our own way, and we want to listen to what we think, and we just need to listen to Christ. Listen to what He said. In John chapter 15, starting at verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, He taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, He pruneth it. And it may bring forth more Fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Nothing. You're barren and unfruitful outside of Christ. We have to abide in Christ. We have to follow what He says. This world needs that so bad. There's so much in divisions and bickering and problems. And if they would just follow Christ, they would resolve so many issues that they have now in this world. Individuals would solve so many problems. They would say, well, who cares for me? Christ. Well, who can save me? Christ. Who can make me give me fulfillment? Christ. If they would just look to Him. If you go to Philippians, if you want to turn there with me. Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to read verse 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There is no way. No way to remove Christ 
if you want to have true peace. You want to be truly filled. You want to truly lay your head down at night in ease, knowing that if you should pass away that night, that you're fine, that you're okay, that you have that peace that settles you, knowing that Christ is there to help you through whatever it is that you're going through. There's no other way. There is no other way that we can possibly have hope in. If you go to Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. You ever notice that as human beings that we try to do all sorts of things except a lot of times that. We try to do all these things that against this there is no law. Against this we can do this as much as we desire. We can partake of this as much as we can. We could show these things toward our fellow man as much as possible, and there is no wrong in it. There is no wrong in this. There is no law. You know, the only way that you can have sin is if there is a law. That law shows us where we have sin. There is no law against this. We can show love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. Against such there is no law. As much as our heart desires to a bus, we can continue to do this. We could do this. Yet this world goes after everything else. They, don't, they go after hate and just complete displeasure out of desire for flesh, to fulfill the flesh but we don't have to. We can be filled in Christ. In verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desires of vain glory, provoking one another, giving, uh, provoking one another, envying one another. We can't walk after the flesh. As Christians, we cannot walk after the flesh. You can't walk kind of after the flesh and kind of after the Spirit. Either you're walking after the flesh or you're walking after the Spirit. This world can't have it both ways. There's people in this world, you hear them speak, and I'm sure you do. I'm sure you hear people say this. I hear it all the time. You hear it on TV or on the radio or somewhere where someone says, well, I'm not following any particular religion. I'm just spiritual. What in the world does that mean? What in the world are you talking about? And let, outside of Christ, you're wasting your time. Why even think there's another way? Because there's not. Christ tells us there's no other way. There's no other way outside of Him. You won't be happy outside of Him. The reason people will do that... I'm going to go over to Acts chapter 4. But the reason people do that is because they see that as a way that they desire and that they can partake a lot of times of the fleshly things this world yet still feel good about their self. Still feel good and think they're still doing something that is kind of okay, but they're not. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they, where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness, and multiplied of them that believed were in of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he Possessed was his own, but they had all things common. All things common. They were all working together. They all had that peace, and they were all working together in one accord. And we see that so often that we as Christians, we need to work in one accord. Far too often in the world that people will have strifes among themselves, and we ought not. We are to work as Christians as one accord, working toward God's purpose and bringing those that are lost to Him and helping our brothers and sisters in Christ be, have peace and help them in times of need, whatever the case may be, but looking toward heaven with one accord. There can be some differences. As Christians, we think about how that we have differences in talents, maybe differences in positions, differences in professions, Just because we have some differences doesn't mean we can't have singleness of mind and service to God. We can and should and we ought always. In Proverbs chapter 28, if you want to turn over there with me. In verse 1, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Have you ever seen someone that was so nervous all the time because they always thought someone was uh, looking over their shoulder. The wicked flee when no man pursues. Sometimes 
people with a guilty conscience. And there can be several reasons, but I'm just focusing on that for right now. Sometimes people with a guilty conscience, they can think someone's pursuing them even when no one is pursuing them because of that guilty conscience. And it says, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Those that are serving God faithfully can be bold as a lion through Christ to bring the words to those that are lost. You can, and I've said this many times in the past, that you can tell when someone is confident. You can tell the difference between someone who's confident or not. When we speak God's Word, not our own. Our own can be full of errors, but when we speak God's Word, we can be confident. When we go with those that are lost, and they say, I'm not sure, you can tell them why well, I am sure. I am positive of the way to get to heaven because Christ has said it. Because He has told us. He has told us we'll have fulfillment. I want to go look at just a couple last verses with you. It's in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. And it's... Chapter 15, verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruptible, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. We can see how that we as Christians, we can look forward to a home of a, a hope of a home in heaven, and we can, we can look at our life. We can look over our life and know that we have assurance that when we leave this life, if we are filled with Christ, we can look and say, I can be at peace knowing that I'm going on. That I'm going on to a place that I'm looking toward a place called heaven. I'm looking toward that eternal peace, that eternal rest that you can only get in Christ. You'll never have eternal rest and eternal peace outside of Christ. It is not possible. As a matter of fact, we read about a place called hell outside of Christ where we go to as human beings, our soul goes to if we're outside of Christ and as a place of eternal torment. So often the TV and the shows, the movies, they portray that in the wrong manner. They give people the wrong idea of what hell is like. It is just an eternal place of torment. It is not a place you'll have any joy whatsoever. It is not a place of love. It is not a place that you wouldn't want to be. It's not a place any of your loved ones would want you to go there. If someone should leave this life, a loved one should leave this life unprepared to meet God, and they should find themselves in that situation, they would desire so much to be able to come back. And we can read about a situation like that. We can read about a situation where someone wanted to come back and tell his family not to come to that awful place. But once we leave this life, it's too late. So we have to make sure that when we leave this life, we're prepared to meet God, that we have our sins washed away with Christ, that it's not our integrity, our righteousness, because our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. It's not us He's looking at. It's Christ. It's Christ's righteousness. His, not ours. I guess the whole lesson can be summed up in that as well. He is not ours. In that we want His peace, His love, His mercy, His fulfillment, not what we come up with. And I want to read these scriptures so that anyone that's not a Christian would know what we must do to have that peace. It's in Romans 10, 17. It says, So the faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. In Hebrews eleven six. 6, But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Luke 13, 3, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Romans 10, 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Let us always strive to bring as many as possible under that first part of that verse, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We want everyone to meet that mark. We want everyone to be right when they leave this life. Thank you for your time as we come together and sing this selected song.